Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for coming out on this rainy Thursday evening. I know the rain sometimes scares people away in the Bay Area, so glad that you're with us. Um, my name is Stacy Silver, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Bay Area Society of Fellows Program. And the Society of Fellows is our community of supporters that help foster, that help provide critical support for the um, Aspen Institute. And I know many of you have been with us before to these lectures before, so welcome again. And for many of you who are new, um, welcome. And first I wanna thank Diane Morris, who is an Aspen Institute trustee and provides um, the underwriting and so generous to support this program. Uh, thank you, Diane. <laughs> and thank you to Garrett Graff, Jocelyn Goldfine, and Jason Matheny for joining us for tonight's discussion about artificial intelligence and its current and future impact on the economy. Garrett is the executive director of Aspen Institute's Cybersecurity and Technology Program, as well as an award-winning journalist who has spent nearly a decade covering national security. So we welcome Garrett, who will now introduce our speakers, and thank you again. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, is my mic on? Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm excited to be here uh, with two people, uh, one of whom I know very well, and one of whom, Jocelyn, I have had the pleasure to get to know over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, just we could not have a more interesting pairing tonight to talk <laughs> about artificial intelligence. Uh, Jocelyn uh, works at Zeta Venture Partners. Mm -hmm. Uh, venture capital firm here in the Bay Area, totally focused on artificial intelligence. Uh, and her background is actually as someone who works in artificial intelligence uh, and knows of what she speaks. And she is responsible for the uh, programming your news feed on Facebook. She was the person <laughs> who came up with the algorithm for uh, the Facebook news feed. So, if you have any comments about Facebook, <laughs> uh, I would encourage you to talk to Jocelyn afterwards. Um, and then uh, Jason Matheny uh, is the director of IARPA, which is the intelligence community's sort of skunk works uh, in Washington. Uh, he probably tires of it, but it is sort of the DARPA for the intelligence community focused on around the corner technologies. Um, and as I was saying earlier, Jason is actually the person who first gave me the why you should be terrified of artificial intelligence talk. Um, <laughs> so I'm pleased to have him here to give it to you tonight <laughs> of why you should be terrified about this. So um, I thought we might start uh, conversationally talking a little bit sort of definitionally, um, you know, sort of what does artificial intelligence mean to you? Um, we, we hear this term sort of thrown around, and then we also hear of machine learning. And sort of are these the same things? Uh, sort of how do you think about what artificial intelligence is and sort of where it is heading? And I will start with Jocelyn. Sure. Well, just in terms of vocabulary, I mean, you know, people vary, but I'll, I'll, I'll give sort of a summary of, of how I use the terms. Um, another term that gets kicked in around is, is big data as well. And so I would say that machine learning refers to a sp particular set of computer science techniques that involve using vast quantities of data and applying statistical regressions and certain algorithmic techniques to um, essentially do, do pattern matching, to classify, to predict, to optimize. Um, and, those, and those techniques have been around for a long time, but it's only really in the last five or 10 years that we have had the inexpensive compute and inexpensive storage and access to these vast data sets that enable those techniques actually to be really effective. Um, and so a lot of the, the sort of AI breakthroughs that have happened in the last few years have actually happened with algorithms from the 80s and 90s. Um, but that were made, the breakthroughs were made possible by the huge data sets and the fast and cheap compute and storage that came with the cloud. And so machine learning is, I think, a good sort of technical term for that set of techniques. Um, an offshoot of machine learning is deep learning, which pre refers to even another subset. And I would say we can use the term artificial intelligence to kind of be a little bit of an umbrella over big data, machine learning, deep learning, 
and some other more technical categories like computer vision and natural language processing that kind of all fall under. I, in a way, I'm kind of sad that we've, we've settled on this term artificial intelligence because although it is the term that kind of the discipline, my discipline of computer science that we have used for this, this body of technologies, it also has this like pop culture, you know, open the pod bay doors, Hal, that, that makes us think of like consciousness and sort of human cognition, which is not implied by any of these technologies. Um, Jason, uh, one of the things that you've sort of said about artificial intelligence over the, uh, the years is that, uh, as Jocelyn says, you know, we have this idea that artificial intelligence is going to lead to Hal and the Terminator. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, sort of your point in talking about this is that the thing that we're, we should be actually most worried about in thinking about this is Flubber. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, sort of explain, right. uh, <laughs> explain sort of how you think about artificial intelligence and sort of what its opportunities and, and challenges are at this stage. Right, it's true. Yeah, and my pop culture references might be a little dated. So, <laughs> but but I, I do think of um, the set of concerns that I have about uh, about AI relate less to Skynet and Terminator uh, and more to accidents of the sort uh, that digital flubber uh, is, um, it kind of represents as a category. So a system that uh, has some powerful effects on parts of society, um, some of those effects uh, are difficult to foresee because of the complexity of the systems that we're working with, uh, and thus you can have unintended consequences. Um, one example of that would be flash crashes within financial markets uh, due to badly programmed algorithmic traders. Uh, other examples would be you know, cascading failures within power networks uh, that are due to bad programming. Uh, those are the kinds of uh, concerns um, that we see most often among technologists who are, are sort of working on the AI, not that AI will become self-aware uh, and decide to dominate the world, but instead that due to a combination of human error uh, and a complexity, um, will develop systems that have uh, accidents. So uh, Jocelyn, um, you know, in, in 2018, you know, uh, our panel topic tonight is the uh, economy of 2025, which actually is uh, not all that far away from where we are right now. Um, and I think sort of when we talk about technology adoption in almost any uh, forum, mm. we overestimate sort of how quickly something is going to come to market, but then underestimate how big the changes are going to be over time. Mm. So give us sort of a sense, you know, in 2018, where is artificial intelligence now? What is it good for? Uh, and, and sort of how is it being applied in the technology programs and the yeah. uh, uses that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's understandable and, and sort of easy to, to believe that sort of AI is sort of right around the corner from replacing all our jobs. And I think, I think part of that is, is because it's, it's sort of hard to know what AI is, is and isn't good at. You know, we get these kind of really vivid examples of, AI winning at Jeopardy or AI beating the world's best chess and Go players. And because chess and Go are comparatively difficult for human beings, we think of AI then as having you know, peak human cognition, peak human ability. But actually, AI is really dumb and bad at things that are kind of easy for humans, like you know, detecting that someone next to you might feel skeptical about what you're saying. or. You know, um, or, 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 or giving somebody a haircut, or you know, deciding if an outfit looks good, or, or delivering good customer service. So, so I think you know, AI's capabilities, you know, where it's strong is not, you know, and what's hard and what's easy for AI is doesn't much resemble what's hard and easy for human beings. So, something like Go, that's that's sort of very mathematical and rigid and predictable, it's pretty easy for AI. Um, something like conducting a conversation or, or translating a language is is quite hard. And so, AI is is quite good at sort of optimizing and, and predicting and making good guesses, it's not necessarily good at picking out sort of the one right answer out of a universe of possibilities. So I think it's no real coincidence that AI had its kind of first commercial successes in things like the Facebook newsfeed or the Netflix movie recommendations um, or in sort of search ranking results 
where it's where it's it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to guess the one right answer. It just has to put the baby picture above the puppy picture if you're more interested in babies. And if it does that, it's successful and you spend more time on Facebook and you have a more delightful experience. But if it puts the puppy in front of the baby, like that's also okay. Nothing terrible happens. You know, compare this to driving a car where, you know, if you mistake a red light for a green one, it's actually disastrous. And so you really need the AI to be at 100% um, correctness rather than sort of 95% correctness to want to wanna put an AI in the driver's seat without a human there as backup. And so I think that, you know, we will see AI have its first successes in, or have additional successes in more areas like this where it's just making a slightly better prediction, a slightly better forecast, you know, that may be, you know, financial trading um, where, although hopefully the consequences of a mistake are not disastrous so far, they have, you know, arguably mostly not been disastrous, <laughs> at least not globally disastrous. Corrected. Yeah. <coughs> yes, yes. So, and, and Jason, sort of what's your, what's your answer? Where do you see AI being good right now, and where do you think that uh, its potential is actually much further down the road than we anticipate? Yeah, I, I agree with Jocelyn. I mean, I think um, we probably underestimate the difficulty of sort of the, the last mile of automation of some tasks that uh, we entrust teenagers with, like driving to our peril. Mm -hmm. um, but that a lot of tasks that we think of as being mentally extraordinarily taxing uh, now are becoming fairly trivial um, for, for automation. So it seems like in the, in the near term, in fact, we were talking about this just earlier, there's, there's lots of tasks that involve imagery, uh, video, uh, in some cases uh, raw text that are fairly easy for machines to process at near or even sometimes uh, exceeding human levels of performance much more cheaply and much more quickly than humans uh, can process the data. For example, identifying objects uh, within an image, uh, looking through very large amounts of, in our, you know, in our world, uh, within the intelligence community, looking at satellite imagery to see what's changed, uh, to identify whether this is a tank from a particular country or a missile launcher, uh, to be able, in some cases, to more accurately diagnose whether a mole is cancerous or not, um, or to be able to detect uh, tumors uh, within mammograms. Um, those sorts of tasks now, I think, are ones where we're seeing uh, machine learning uh, outperform uh, human experts. Um, and that's a good thing. I mean, for, for those sorts of tasks, the, um, uh, the level of human effort that's required to perform well is extraordinarily costly. So uh, being able to complement human abilities so that we can allow the human to focus on the problems where really their cognitive skills are most needed and not to have to look through thousands of hours of video or imagery in order to pick out a single tank. Uh, when we were talking uh, before the panel, um, you know, we, we hear so much about sort of the fear of the loss of the jobs of the truck drivers, mm. that, that, you know, that truck driver in 27 of the 50 states is the most numerous job mm. in the American economy. And, uh, and, and sort of both of you said that actually you think that it's going to be security guards and radiologists <laughs> that, are, that lose their jobs before the truck drivers do. So uh, explain sort of what you, what you meant by that. Well, I want to say first that actually the, the truck driver job is, is not one that's very attractive to lots of people. And actually by 2025, the average truck driver will be in his 50s because people are retiring faster than they're then they're entering this, this job category. And so it may be that we really require the robots to come along and drive the trucks because humans don't want that job anymore. Um, but, I, but I still believe that it's going to be very hard for robots to drive trucks, um, especially because fine motor control is hard for, for, for I, I think AI will be good at telling red lights from green lights you know, in 99% of cases. But if you take you know, a still image of a child standing in front of a traffic light holding a red balloon with the balloon part obscuring the green part of the light. An AI cannot, that's an incredibly hard problem. It's a trivial problem for a human being. And it is just deeply difficult um, for an AI. So there was sort of this great example. I think it might yeah. have even been in California mm. uh, uh, three weeks ago. A Tesla drove into the back of a stopped fire truck, yep. which was part of the way that a Tesla camera works is that it ignores stationary objects because the whole point is that there are lots of stationary objects on the interstate. Um, <laughs> and that 
a sort of a problem yeah. that a human driver would have been very easily able to avoid, which yes. is not running into the fire truck parked in the lane of the right. interstate. Yeah, uh, yeah. The Tesla drove right into the back of it at 35 miles an hour. So, I mean, I think part of it is that driving a car, driving a truck is not a single task. It's like thousands of tasks that, that humans are very good generalists and are, and are able to accomplish all of those tasks. And they're not just vision tasks, um, but certainly the vision tasks are quite varied. Um, on the other hand, something like looking at an MRI or an ultrasound and sort of detecting a tumor or looking at satellite imagery and finding a tank, like that is the kind of problem that is, that is very static, that's amenable to sort of like, let me give you a couple million images that are labeled that tell you whether there's a tumor there or not. And the AI becomes better at the human being and understanding or at, at matching the pattern um, that is present across all those, those millions of images. And so those are things that, that AI is going to become very good at. And I would say vision is one of the things that AI is, is really good at. So when I think of jobs that, that may be transformed by AI in the near future, I think ones that are performed by humans that have not yet been automated you know, by traditional, by like, like toll collectors have been automated by credit card machines. That doesn't require AI, right? So jobs that have been resistant to automation so far, um, what's true of them? What, what necessitates a human being? Something that's only involving a human being because it requires vision, um, that's probably going to be sort of an earliest job category that, that succumbs to, to AI. But I think that there are other job categories. Just as sort of bank tellers were not replaced by ATMs, but actually we have far more bank tellers now than we did at the time. Like we took away the menial task of counting money, but we, um, but we introduced all these new service tasks because banking services were able to expand and we were able to have a lot more branches. Um, I think similarly, something can happen in a lot of job categories. And I'll give the example of machine translation. Um, there is a company that Zed has invested in called Lilt that has um, one of the most impressive machine translation teams and technology stacks um, anywhere. This, this, this team came out of labs at Stanford and, and built earliest editions of Google Translate. And they're going after the trans, not the sort of cheap, free Google Translate market, but the, but the market of translations that's so important, like translating contracts and government documents and, and you know, the written the books and websites and marketing material um, that you use human beings for today. And they've built technology that is not human independent, but that works in concert with a human translator so that a human translator can now translate seven times as much text in the same amount of time. So, um, so what that does is it doesn't put human translators out of a job. It makes translation so much cheaper that we actually find that we are willing and desire to translate not just seven times, but maybe 10 times or 100 times more material. And all of a sudden, the world becomes a lot flatter, and we can all understand each other a lot better because everything's available in every language because translation has become so cheap and so correct. Um, so I think that, that there is opportunity. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the optimist up here tonight. Like, I think there's the opportunity for job expansion um, just as much or more than job replacement because we're able to, to change these job categories and make them so much more effective and so much more broadly available. So uh, Jason, I, I'd be curious to, uh, uh, if I can sort of interpret Jocelyn's answer there as sort of the places that she has seen recently sort of AI wow her. Sort of where uh, you spend a lot of time in this space, sort of talking to people uh, about you know what's around the corner. Uh, where have you seen AI surprise you and excite you recently? Yeah, I think um, I think there's two areas where um, there's a lot of excitement um, and panic uh, about the potential for for AI and its applications. Um, one is this sort of general notion of self-play. Uh, is that you can develop AI systems that achieve very high levels of performance uh, without having a lot of historical data uh, that's been provided to them. Instead, you have sort of two competing AIs that ratchet up their level of play uh, in some sort of simulated environment. And that environment could be a physical one in which you know, you've got sort of wrestling simulated bots, or they're playing chess or Go, uh, or some other sort of strategic game. In the area of cybersecurity, um, there's, there's even been work to look at how you can ratchet up the improvements, both offensive and defensive sides of cybersecurity by having AIs play against one another. <laughs> uh, so that's one general area where I think there's a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, fast work that's, um, that's pushing the edge forward. Um, the other area is um, something called generative adversarial networks. Or GANs, uh, or impress Gans. your friends. Yes, that's right. <laughs> if you've got nerds who, who you want to impress, this is a great way. Get Buy the t-shirt. <laughs> um, the, the work on this is, 
um, is sort of like how do you how do you fool an AI and then how do you have a competing AI detect that it's that it's being fooled? Mm -hmm. uh, the areas in which this can be applied uh, include um, in, uh, finding ways of uh, creating uh, data that are artificial but that appear to human eyes to be genuine. Uh, for example, forged photographs or forged videos. Uh, in some cases, forge speech, but on the defensive side, finding ways of detecting such forgeries. Um, in, in our realm of intelligence, um, one application of this that we worry a lot about uh, is how propaganda can become much more sophisticated through the use of forged media. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's probably closer to my panic area than my excitement area, uh, but it's one where there are a lot of positive applications by being able to improve our detection. Mm -hmm. So, and I was going to uh, actually uh, ask a little bit about that because we had been talking. Uh, you know, I I spent a lot of my time in the cybersecurity policy world, um, and this is an area particularly where uh, you know offense has been far better than defense for you know twenty five years now, and some of that is uh, you know foundational problems with the technology uh, of the internet itself that it was an inherently insecure medium when we built it and we sort of didn't really ever intend for it to be the global center of all banking and commerce when it started out as like a fun research network for a bunch of nerds to trade information around. Uh, and I mean that in a very loving way. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, as we've been talking about this uh, in preparation for tonight, we've been talking about sort of the AI levels that playing field a little bit. And uh, Jason, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about how you see uh, cybersecurity and sort of security online changing in the era of artificial intelligence? Yeah, I think, um, I think defense is still going to be harder than offense. I mean, I think possibly forever. Uh, but I think that the cost asymmetry is likely to decrease. So right now, to do something really damaging, you know, using a cyber weapon or some advanced malware um, is probably, you know, on order, you know, a thousand to a million times cheaper than developing the defensive systems needed to protect against that. And we have sort of the same asymmetry in many other areas of technology. You know, it's, it's about a, a million times more expensive to develop a new vaccine than to develop uh, de novo a new virus. Um, so whether or not that, um, that asymmetry exists sort of on net, I kind of I think offense will always have the advantage. But because there are many more people who sort of are inclined to not want the world to break down and not want networks to break, um, as long as you decrease that cost asymmetry, Fred. that's right, um, you then um, ultimately, as a society, are better protected. And I think in cybersecurity, we have seen that, uh, that spread already start to decrease. For example, the DARPA Cyber Challenge, offense still won, but defense was much less costly. Jocelyn, you, I think you've also worked on this. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. We, um, we're an AI fund, not a cybersecurity fund, but, but we think that cybersecurity is absolutely one of the most exciting applications of, of AI. And I think it's for exactly the reason that you named, that the, the, the defender has to protect everything. And by the way, our surface area of vulnerability is expanding exponentially as our employees now have you know eight devices each and they're showing up with their you know not, not just their mobile phone but also their tablet and maybe their toaster that all want to connect to the network and um, and there's been a rising trend too which is you know we talk about the consumerization of IT but what the cloud has really wrought on the enterprise is that IT no longer gets to be in charge of all technology decisions building a new product or buying a new product is now the province of the business. The, the head of sales is buying the CRM software. The head of finance is buying you know, the finance software. You know, the, the, the head of ops may be thinking about yield optimization and, and factory automation. Um, and so IT you know, was, in some, was in some ways too big a bottleneck, but IT was also a single place to stand to protect all those systems. Um, and, so the, and so the surface area has just sort of massively exponentially grown at, this, at the same time as, um, you know, the defender has to protect all of that and the uh, offense side only needs to find one vulnerability. But at the same time that that surface area is large and the opportunities for attackers are many, anything an attacker wants to do in a networked world leaves a trace, leaves a record. 
any time they, you know, anything that involves an attacker getting into your systems, that involves network packets which flow. Any data leaving your firewall involves network packets that flow. The problem is, you know, it's hundreds of packets out of billions. And so how could a human being possibly check every packet, possibly look at every possible suspicious um, transaction? And it can't. But you know what's really, really great at looking at billions of data points and spotting anomalies or violations of patterns? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data. So, so I, I think they, they, they hold the hope of, as you say, narrowing the spread, um, decreasing, decreasing the cost to defend. Um, and so I think there's tremendous promise in the, in the, of, of using AI to defend our systems, not just to attack. So before uh, we open it up to, to questions, um, and I assume we've actually answered almost all of the questions about artificial intelligence so far. So <laughs> yes, right. we don't actually have very many from the audience. Uh, but I, w I wanted to ask you both uh, an unfair humanist question. Um, in uh, as sort of technologists uh, with a uniquely sort of long-term focus uh, on sort of where the world is going. Um, this is a seminar, a seminar on you know, leadership and innovation. And in thinking ahead to a world where artificial intelligence will dominate so many aspects of our daily lives, what should we as a society be thinking about in terms of educating the next generation of students? And sort of what, what should we be preparing them uh, to do differently than the way that we're preparing them now. I mean, I, this is a really, um, you know, this question is near and dear to me. I have uh, two school-aged daughters right now. They're ages 10 and 13. We're in the fifth and seventh grade in uh, public schools down in Los Altos. And actually, my husband sits on the, the local school board. And um, so we're very passionate about education. Um, and I actually sit on the board of trustees at Harvey Mudd College, a really excellent mm. STEM college in, in Southern California. And there's no question that sort of, I think we're having kind of a, a, a crisis of, of imagination, of faith, of, of sort of imagining what education will be like in seven or 10 or 20 years um, at every level, at the you know, K-12, at higher ed, you name it. Um, but I think what's, what's certainly clear is that we must like this, this idea of education is something that happens when you're a child and that completes as you enter adulthood and then you're done with education. That era is over. We have to prepare humans and citizens who have the ability to learn. We have to equip everyone with the ability to continuously learn throughout their lifetimes. And we have to think about education as something that doesn't stop at age 22, but, but sort of continues on through people's lives and, and, and that co-evolves with their careers and their work. Jason? Uh, so uh, I feel odd saying this because I'm usually like the Debbie Downer uh, in the group. But I think one important thing to impress upon um, uh, students is just how much better the world is today than um, even 100 years ago. I mean, you know, a 12-fold improvement in real GDP per capita globally, um, a 90% reduction in infant mortality rates, um, a doubling in literacy rates um, uh, and rates of, of voting and, and democratic participation. I mean, the world is just profoundly better uh, than even a century ago. And I think that, uh, that can help then create sort of a sense of optimism about even how much better things could be uh, in 100 years from now if we sort of get everything right. That is, if we avoid any like, major hiccups um, in civilization. Um, as to how to avoid major hiccups, um, I think one thing that it would be useful um, to have as part of every computer science curriculum um, is a class on ethics, you know, is understanding what are our responsibilities as citizens to make the world better and how can we use the skills uh, that we're obtaining in computer science and other disciplines in order to make the world better. Uh, I think part of that is that we do really need to have a security and safety mindset. The systems that we build need to be robust to a range of insults. I mean, not only those that are intentional from you know, bad actors that want to create you know, propaganda systems or autonomous weapons using tools that are now commercially available, uh, but also uh, robust to human error. Um, and I, I, think, um, I think the kind of Hippocratic oath 
um, that medicine has is something that could be replicated throughout other disciplines. Well, if we're straight into optimism, then it's definitely time to turn <laughs> to the audience question because we need to bring, the, bring Jason back down. So um, should we be passing around a mic or, okay. Okay, great, over here. I have a question for Jason. Jason, how do you feel the U.S. should respond to cyber attacks? Do you think the U.S. should take a more forward approach to deter some of these bad actors by having a counter attack mm -hmm. or a strike so that possibly that could lead to more of a detente situation given the cost uh, differences between offense and defense? Yeah, you know, in the... Um, uh, in the Cold War, there was so much intellectual energy that was focused on uh, nuclear war strategy and trying to understand what are the appropriate levels of response to various categories of nuclear or non-nuclear threats. And that, uh, that kind of intellectual energy hasn't yet been applied, but is starting to be applied uh, to the cyber realm. I think the answer is it depends. I mean, it really does depend on, um, on the particulars of how significant the cyber attack was what are the consequences of some sort of retaliation that would be cyber in nature as opposed to non-cyber, some other form of, uh, of sanction or, or diplomatic penalty. Um, but I, one of the things that um, I really admire about Garrett and to make a, a, a plug for, uh, for work that he's done, particularly in the book uh, Raven Rock that he wrote, is thinking about some of the, the um, perils of, um, of strategic planning um, in, in the case of Garrett's book, it's focused on nuclear war planning during the Cold War. Um, but when you sort of imagine worst case scenarios and how to avoid them, human beings can make all sorts of mistakes. I mean, some of it's due to kind of just bureaucratic error, um, like the institutional interests of different organizations that kind of want to protect their own budgets. Uh, and I then do worry about, well, if we start creating a kind of brain trust around like cyber strategy, uh, which sorts of institutions have the most to gain and lose? So I, I do think the public discussion about what cybersecurity strategy needs to be should really be as open as possible and not reserved for national security officials. Well, so let me use the moderator's prerogative to ask a, a follow-up question from his question, which is, uh, I'd be interested in both of your perspectives on sort of how the U.S. is doing internationally on artificial intelligence compared to, um, let's randomly choose a major foreign adversary of the second largest economy in the world, China. Um, I think there's no question that, um, that the U.S. is the home to the most leading research, to the most advanced researchers, to the, the best labs, and to the companies that are, that are exploiting AI with the most commercial success right now. But I think it would be a real mistake to take our eye off of China. I think the government is making incredible investments. There are very brilliant scientists and researchers and companies um, and that are, that are absolutely focused on AI because it is a new wave of change, because it is still um, you know, greenfield um, to, 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 to make a land grab, to laugh and go around us. And I think that's, that's a real danger if, um, if, if we do not continue to invest. And I, and I think it, it, it bears remarking that, that R&D spend from the US government is a, is a huge, is a foundational um, it, it, to the development of all of, all of these techniques, all of these, um, all of these sciences. And the, the R&D budgets of you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, all of those put together are like a tiny fraction um, of what the U.S. government um, can and in the past has spent um, and may or may not be spending going forward. So I think it's pretty imperative to keep investing to maintain our edge. Um, and, and I would say that, that AI has also been blossoming all over the world, that, that we don't have at all anything remotely resembling um, a monopoly on it. In fact, Canada is incredibly strong in AI. The government there had been investing in AI for the last 20 or 30 years and is really stepping up their game now. Um, in some ways, I, like, I'm really excited to back startups that are based in Canada because the availability of R&D credits from the Canadian government, even for these tiny early stage startups, is, is immense. It can be half their R&D budget. Um, and if I'm writing a $1 million check, knowing that they're going to get $3 million from the Canadian government gives me a lot of leverage on, on my investment. Um, there's also real strongholds um, across Europe and Israel. You know, so they're, they're in, and certainly in Eastern Europe, um, 
So, so there, AI is blossoming everywhere. We don't have a monopoly on great data sets. We don't have a monopoly on these algorithms. Um, and we need to keep investing. Jason, do you concur with that? I do. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, all the way in the back. Yeah, um, your talk comes at an interesting time. The Atlantic Monthly just released an article a couple of days ago. Michio Kaku just did, uh, released a book. And you might have already talked about Stephen Hawking. And, you know, there was an article in the New York Times just now about how his fear, as he speaks about it, was this prescient sense that um, AI is going to lead to uh, the obsolescence of humanity. And, you know, you talk about the economy, and we wonder, like, is something larger just laughing at us that it even has anything to do with the economy? Because, um, you know, if you go over to Hiroshima, you'll see that Albert Einstein and his whole faction was saying, don't use it. It could be used for something bad. But what about with respect to deflecting asteroids and everything else we're doing with AI that's a lot larger than just you know what China's doing in Europe and Russia economically? And they, in other words, they're talking about AIs using those kind of technologies for uh, technologies that will deflect asteroids and do things like that. Yeah, and so I think, uh, you know, the question is, you know, how, how do we ensure, sort of as, as you were talking about, you know, everyone should be taking an ethics class, you know, how do you ensure that humans actually remain at the center of artificial intelligence even as it becomes better and better and better? Uh, yeah, so having read uh, Kaku's book, Future of Humanity, which is really uh, a wonderful read, um, yeah, I mean, generally an optimistic take. Hawking was definitely less uh, optimistic and, um, you know, encouraged space um, exploration in part just so that all our eggs wouldn't be in one basket because of some of the technological threats that we face. Um, and actually thinking about it, maybe like digital flubber for this room, there's probably a better uh, example, which is Sorcerer's Apprentice, since we're in the... Walt Disney Family Museum. Uh, I think that's the sort of scenario that Hawking was most worried about, was just that you have sort of a powerful amplifier of all sorts of um, human ambitions um, that might be um, uh, misapplied and might lead to disaster. Uh, we can certainly see some instances of that, uh, say, in autonomous weapons that um, I'm grateful that the United States government has decided through policy to ensure that there's meaningful human control over weapon systems. Uh, not every country has made that decision. Uh, so how do we ensure that other countries uh, do commit to meaningful control over weapon systems? So part through policy, uh, part through sort of cultural norms and, and debates. Uh, but this is a very difficult thing to verify, right? So. We, nuclear weapons are sort of like the easiest thing to verify because uh, new weapons programs are observable from space. They have distinct signatures. Literally. Yeah, <laughs> whereas, whereas cyber um, and the AI realm, very difficult to actually verify what somebody has done, what they've built. Uh, the infrastructure is widely distributed. The expertise is widely distributed. Um, so ensuring that we and have defense looks a lot like offense exactly. when you're inside. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Much much more analogous, I would say, to biological weapons. Um, so finding ways of ensuring that everybody does have a human in the loop with our most important weapons decisions, like those governing the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, there's a Russian system called Perimeter, which is basically you know a semi-automated uh, nuclear weapons command and control system. That's pretty terrifying. Uh, to automate any aspect of nuclear weapon decision making. And um, so we know that uh, that sort of automation is possible and being pursued by other countries. Great. I'm glad we're into the optimistic uh, part of yes. <laughs> Down here. Yeah. I would just say it depends which human you have in charge of those systems. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, I want to come back to the, uh, the education, and I thought AI applied to education is actually an interesting topic because mm -hmm. it's not too different than translation where there's a lot of repetitive, uh, ongoing learning that uh, students do when they're young. Um, and AI actually has the opportunity, potentially, to uh, create more one-on-one -on -one education, um, 
more targeted education with better support by teachers who will hopefully be paid better in that environment. Mm -hmm. So that's just a comment. Uh, my question was, um, we have these GANs now, which you explained to us, so we have AIs fighting against AIs. We also have AIs now training other AIs, mm -hmm. and so we're starting to get this hierarchical stacking. No chance that goes back. <laughs> right, so that, that was my right. question. Is, you know, what are the chances that this hierarchical stacking actually accelerates exponentially and uh, we get this more emergent AI faster than we expect? Well, I think actually some of the, the best and most successful results that are happening now in, in things like image recognition, things like natural language processing, um, they are in fact coming from stacking and combining um, AI models with different techniques. So I would say uh, yes, that is likely to happen, that is likely to accelerate the problems that AI can solve. Um, you know, that a technique that is, that, you know, has, is good at some things and has some flaws, you combine it with something else and they, you know, they reinforce each other in their weak spots. Um, so, you know, absolutely, that's, that's part of the path that is, that is bringing AI faster. Uh, one of the things, you know, you talked a little bit about chess and go, mm -hmm. uh, which has been, you know, such a fascinating uh, and, and sort of understandable uh, thing for people to latch on to in, in this. And, and it, I thought it was so interesting to watch how that cycle unfolded, which is for a long time you had humans being able to beat the computer, mm -hmm. then the computers were able to beat the humans, mm -hmm. then the humans working with the computers were able to beat the computer again, mm -hmm. and then finally the computers are now able to beat the human working with the computers. Right, the, the human is now the weak link. Yes. Yes. Brings down the average. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could comment. You know, I know a, a lot of people think AI is going to take over the world, but I've been reading a little bit more about quantum computing. And I was wondering if you could, you guys have looked at applications there, your thoughts on it. Pretty much what we Yeah, well, I, I think so. So I'll, I'll sort of circle back to what I said at the, the beginning, which is sort of. AI represents sort of algorithms applied to big data sets and um, into doing tons and tons of computations on those data sets. And so if you think about quantum, what it enabled, and, and so all this was unlocked. Give the, give the super short, easy to understand definition of quantum computing. Oh, uh, I don't know if I can do as well as uh, Justin Trudeau. Um, quantum computing are computers that take advantage of quantum um, phenomena in, in sort of quantum entanglement in, in, in sort of the property of, of bits to be neither a zero nor a one, but sort of some quantum state in between. And as a result, they are able to do certain calculations orders of magnitude faster and in higher volume than sort of traditional silicon-based um, computer architectures like we're used to in our current data centers, servers, and, and, and laptops and the like. Um, and so what quantum computing represents is just you know, if you like, um, faster, more powerful computers um, with far more storage capacity. And so what that could potentially enable is just for these same AI algorithms to be far more powerful and far more effective um, at solving even problems that, that require, um, you know, more compute than is, is practical right now. It still relies on there being a large enough data set. So there are some problems that quantum can help with. It can't help with the problem of not having enough data. Um, but there is definitely reason to believe that quantum should be able to unlock breakthroughs in areas like drug discovery, which have so far eluded, you know, even really promising, you know, experiments and, and high expectations of AI being able to discover new drugs or sort of understand, crack the human genome. Um, you know, I think the if quantum might, quantum combined, quantum enabled um, AI algorithms, you know, may have, a, may have a shot at some of those problems. Climate, I think, is another big one that has just sort of, you know, infinity variables, right? Like we talk about the, the butterfly wing flapping in the tropics and the hurricane in the Midwest and, um, and, and that being sort of impossibly large amounts of data to, to process and understand. Um, and I think that is, again, a place where like maybe quantum gives us a, a handle. And I think, you know, it, it, it would be really timely, like, you know, speaking to, you know, threats to human existence in the next hundred years, AI is on the list. But, but if AI can help us with climate change, then, that, you know, that's, that might be even higher on the list. Mm -hmm. Jason, sort of the, the probably simplest uh, explanation for what quantum could do is the first quantum computer that is sort of truly a quantum computer will instantly be able to break every human code 
uh, an encryption mechanism that we have ever designed. You're, so you're getting me back to downer. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thanks, so Karen. sort of like, uh, yeah. so how are you sort of thinking about the power that these computers are going to end up bringing to uh, sort of a world where we already feel like computers have transformed our daily lives? Yeah, I mean, as, as Jocelyn pointed out, there are lots of uh, great positive applications of, of quantum computing, um, but it, it does um, it does threaten um, the encryption that um, most of our systems currently rely on. The good news is there are forms of encryption that are um, resistant to these kinds of quantum attacks that aren't dependent on factoring, um, and there's there's pursuit of those kinds of encryption, um, but we probably need to be investing more. Mm -hmm. uh, up there, yeah. Um, I'd like to ask Jason, who's a, sort of a member of the intelligence community, or peripherally yeah, related. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we've had a kind of disturbing pattern of things developed for the intelligence community, for national security, come back into a sort of civilian realm, back into the United States. And I think, of, for example, we've been reading recently about the use of Palantir in Afghanistan and Iraq to help figure out where roadside bombs were, or which terrorists uh, hit by drones, and now we're seeing them in local police agencies, and they're using spider grams and the highly developed integration of data and synthesis and so forth to just track friends of friends of friends. And I'm just wondering from where you sit if, if that isn't an additional concern in the civil liberties realm in terms of bringing all, bringing all this back to where the rubber meets the road in our communities with, with community policing, really. Um, thank you, and and um, and not to be an apologist, but just to clarify, I mean, Palantir was originally developed for commercial applications. Um, for I mean, I think it was PayPal that developed it uh, mainly to identify uh, fraud uh, within financial systems. Uh, there's certainly many positive examples of sort of spillover effects of um, you know intelligence technologies that now are used commercially uh, by consumers. Um, you know, like uh, uh, GPS um, and uh, 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 keyhole, which ultimately you know led to Google Maps. Um, but your your point, your general point stands, which is that there's a tension between um, security and privacy and civil liberties. Uh, and one way in which we try to address the need for protecting privacy while also uh, ensuring security. Uh, is by investing in, in things where we can advantage both at the same time. So I think we're probably one of the largest investors in something called homomorphic encryption, uh, which is a technology that allows you to uh, run analysis of certain kinds of data while it remains encrypted. Um, so you could protect electronic health records, but CDC would be able to tabulate, say, the total number of people who have the flu without releasing any private um, information. Um, for us, that's useful also because you could be looking only at, say, a subset of data in which you want to know whether somebody's mentioned, you know, uranium or plutonium, uh, without uh, unveiling lots of otherwise private data. So I think that there are um, uh, cases in technology where we can get both privacy and security gains at the same time. All right, uh, down here question for Jocelyn about true translation. The three questions. One, uh, is there a commercial application? Is it different from Microsoft's true text? And uh, could you just elaborate on how it works? Sure. The, the company is called Lilt. And they don't have a consumer-facing product. They sell only to companies. Um, so a company like Etsy might, um, might buy translation services from Lilt. To translate, Etsy is an e-commerce catalog, and they uh, almost like eBay, where sort of end users upload products and listings, and so the capacity to translate all those listings means they can do a lot more business. Um, so they sell only to businesses, and um, and the the it, it uses a, a technology called neurotranslation that that is, uses deep neural nets and um, and what is special about their technology, unlike Google Translate, is that it's adaptive. So if you plug a phrase into Google Translate, um, it gives you an answer and it might be a little bit off. You know, if you're bilingual, you might notice, oh, this is not quite right. Um, but there's no opportunity for you to correct it. Um, or, you know, even if you change it in their little text box, they're not taking that and learning from it. 
whereas Lilt works hand in hand with a human translator. So given you know, a set amount of text, um, you know, what the human translator will see is a dashboard where they see the English text and then side by side, the, tra or the, the source language and the si destination language side by side. And they sort of go through approve, 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 you know, correct change. And, as they may, and, what's, and what's beautiful about this is AI gets better with more data and models improve as they are trained in a, a technique called supervised learning. Um, and so the act of a human translator you know, going through and approving and correcting makes the human translator far more productive. They, their output is that they've translated seven times as much material, seven, seven times the amount of material in the same amount of time. But also all those corrections get fed back into the machine, get fed back into the neural net and the model so that it's a little bit smarter and it's a little bit more apt to get that translation correct the next time. And the, the beauty of it is that it's not just a little more correct for that one human translator who's working with it, but the thousands of human translators who use the LILT system, you know, that one correction helps all of them. <clears throat> and so this will have what we call network effect um, to, to enable the product to hopefully um, increase, you know, increase its correctness in a, in a compounding way and perhaps someday not need humans. And Microsoft, the relationship to Microsoft? There's no relationship to Microsoft. All right, I think we are technically out of time, but I'm just going to keep taking questions. Um, maybe down here, and then we'll take this one back here, and then wrap up. So who invests oh. in the U.S.? Who invests? Is it DARPA or NIH, or uh, where's the money coming from? Where, where should it be coming from? Uh, so in, in the U.S. government, um, the largest investors in machine learning research are IARPA, DARPA, National Science Foundation, uh, and uh, NIST, I think, in, in, in that order. Um, and then in, in industry, uh, there's quite a lot of internal investment and, and research um, from, you know, the, the, all the way from the large companies to uh, venture capital firms. Um, and maybe do you want to, is there sort of a, a general sense of the scale of that investment? Um, certainly in the billions. I don't think it's quite at U.S. government levels, though. I think it's probably a quarter. I think is the that that I'm not. I can't. I can't cite a statistic for that though. But that's. I believe that's what I read. If you added together the R and D, the R and D budgets, this may be R and D in general, not AI in particular. Um, so it might even be a less favorable ratio. All right, and then I think the last question up here. With a ten-year-old and a thirteen-year-old in public school, one question about the potential for artificial intelligence to increase human intelligence, and specifically how it might be used as a classroom tool to make didactic education more compelling and more effective. Um, I'm sure it can be. I, you know, I wait. My my kids are just too old. You know, if only I was having kids today. Um, uh, I mean, and, and, and I mean, by just too old, I mean only a little bit too old because I think these, I think these applications are under development now. Um, and certainly you could probably find private schools. There's one here in San Francisco called Alt School. Um, the, 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 and, and, you know, I see startups all the time working in this space. And, and certainly the emphasis, um, as described, is on personalized learning, is on sort of the ability of an AI to understand <clears throat> what is a student doing well and where is a student struggling and to direct more lessons, you know, in the areas where gaps need to be filled or where there's more interest. Um, but I, there is also, I think, tremendous opportunity in terms of, you know, not all human beings learn in the same manner. You know, for some it's more effective to hear it, for some it's more effective to see it, for some it's more effective to, to be hands-on than building it. I think we know pretty across the board actually that hands-on is better. Um, but 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 hands-on is expensive, and so AI assistance um, may enable us, and, and virtual worlds, um, you know, may enable us to, to 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 build that kind of experience for every student, um, and to deliver it at at a cost that is that that is scalable and leverageable to every student. Um, so I think that that technology potential is is out there. I think it's coming very soon. I think certainly will be a real factor um, by 2025. It will probably start in private schools, but I think, you know. Hope and pray will extend to, to public schools very rapidly, and um, you know, and I, I and I and I think it holds out great promise. Well, unfortunately, we end on a note of optimism tonight. <laughs> Jason, Jocelyn, thank you so much for joining us tonight.